Welcome to High Noon, where we talk about controversial subjects with interesting people. And one of those interesting people is my boss, Hadley Manning. Um, so this week, I have my boss on. Hadley Heath Manning is Vice President for Policy at Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice, which are, is our sister organization. Um, Hadley, I'm so glad to, to finally have you on. We're, we're, we're going to have her on to talk about this really interesting article that she managed to get published in the New York Times, which is unusual because they usually don't like to publish interesting things. <laughs> um, but uh, her, her piece is called the, the Conservative Position on Birth Control is about individual responsibility. Um, so we're going to talk about that and we're going to talk about sort of the mixed feelings that I think a lot of women, both on the left and on the right, really have uh, now towards the sexual revolution. But after all that, Hadley, welcome to High Noon. Hey, it's great to be here. I'm a big fangirl of high noon. So I've listened to just about every episode. And I have to say, I don't, I'm not a big podcast listener in general, not a big podcast person in general. So uh, high noon holds a special status. I'll still listen. I'll still tune into high noon. It's always good to have your boss be a fan of your work. That's, yeah. the, that's the best uh, <laughs> best position possible for me. I feel like you better stop calling me your boss because <laughs> we're about to talk about sex and like birth control. <laughs> like we're about to talk about some like not politically correct topics here, but that's what makes it interesting. Yeah. So you wrote this piece um, in the New York Times emphasizing, I would say, uh, both freedom and restraint and personal responsibility. It's, it's a very, um, I would say it's like a very John Adams-esque sort of position, right? Uh, a, a ordered liberty requires individual restraint and good choices. Um, so first of all, you know, why did you decide to write about birth control? Um because it, it seems like for so long it's been outside of the political mainstream to even discuss sort of upsides, downsides about birth control. It's been, you know, something that the genie's out of the bottle. The, the right has kind of given up on discussing it. Uh, the left pretends that the right wants to, like, hold women down and forcibly impregnate them, right? That, that's sort Man of the yeah. Right, Adman's Maid's Tale scenario. So what made you decide now to to sort of put your voice out there on this this issue? Yeah, well, I'll give you the real answer to that, the honest answer, and that is they came to me, the New York Times um, asked for my input on this, and I think that's because I've written about birth control. Previously, I was really involved with um, health policy, health reform. Um, the Affordable Care Act included, as everybody knows now, a mandate for insurance companies to cover all FDA approved forms of birth control from the first dollar. Um, I thought this was a bad rule. I argued about that for, you know, till I was blue in the face. Um, back when that was relevant, back when there were nuns having to sue the government to get out from under this mandate. Um, and my position on that was always not just, uh, you know, a religious based argument. I'm not Catholic. I don't have a religious objection to birth control. I've used birth control, um, but I think it's it's just bad policy for a variety of reasons. It does create um, moral problems between employers um, who don't you know who, who don't want to pay for your birth control, and also it just is bad from an economic perspective when you strip away any um, copay or any um, price for a consumer at the point of consumption. You're going to end up with overconsumption. But um, anyway, that was that was how I got started on, you know, birth control politics. I've also argued in favor of birth control being over the counter. So for some people, that might seem like a contradiction. You know, I want it to be more available to women who want to just go to CVS and buy birth control, but maybe less available in terms of um, I don't support a policy that requires insurance coverage for it. And I don't support really any policy that mandates insurance coverage for anything, because that's how that's how we've gone down this road of, you know, health insurance no longer functioning like real insurance. It's just a, a payment plan for all of our health care services, basically. So that's how I got involved. And that's why I think that's in part why I think the New York Times asked me to write it. The real answer Inez, is I think that they could have asked Ross Douthat or any number of intellectual conservatives um, who are Catholic to write about this. But for for a variety of reasons, those um, Catholic friends and allies of ours might not have felt comfortable, you know, writing a long essay about, <laughs> about birth control, understanding maybe that their personal positions on birth control are outside of the mainstream in some ways. Yeah, it's interesting for most of human history, right? That this was not even something 
uh, that one would have a position on so much, but because although there have always been ways to control fertility, natural ways to control uh, fertility, and women have used those in the past, um, we had this huge technological revolution, which went alongside the cultural revolution of the 1960s. And I believe it's 1963, right, when the first um, birth control pill, oral birth control. Yeah. Pill. Maybe not just coincidental that these things yeah. are happening at the same time, right? Oh, it just happened to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what, what is your view on that? Um, I, I realize it's a bit of a chicken and an egg issue, but uh, do you think the culture and the sexual revolution it, was leading the technology? Or do you think that this particular technology, the ability to really uh, effectively control fertility um, for the woman, do you think that that is what made possible a lot of the the sort of swing towards sexual so-called sexual liberation yeah and i don't i think it's still up for debate how effective the most popular forms of birth control have been i mean it, there's there's statistics that suggest that the typical use failure rate of the pill is like nine percent so i to answer your question i think the pill really brought about the mainstream changes in sexual behaviors. I think you, yes, you've always had um, natural family planning, and but but the risk of pregnancy has always been, I think, a key driver in how people make decisions about not just when to have sex, but wh whom to have sex with. And when the pill came along, and importantly, I think the pill came along with the promise of sex without the consequence of pregnancy, whether or not it's been good on that promise. I think, you know, talk to the many <laughs> women who've conceived while they're on the pill, right? But it, it at least brought the, um, the idea or the understanding between men and women that uh, she's got control of this. It, so it's her responsibility. You know, it definitely has been, um, it has been within the female body. That's where the hormones are being ingested. That's where the expectation of responsibility has been. But it's not perfectly effective. And for that reason, we've seen an explosion, I think, in, you know, pregnancies that have happened between people who never intended to become parents together. And um, it's been, I think, it's had bad effects for family structure. It's contributed to, you know, not just the demand for abortion, um, which is really what the New York Times asked me to write about, but it's also contributed to a higher number of children who are being raised by single parents, usually single moms. And so I think the pill brought about the widespread changes. Now, of course, we wouldn't have been looking for this. We wouldn't have been developing or looking to develop this kind of technology unless there wasn't a demand for it. People wanted greater control over their fertility, right? But then how it's been used and how it's been perceived and the ideas that it's the norms that it's changed, I think I think that's the direction I would, I would say that the causal arrow has, has tended to go. Um, it's interesting because we're we're both millennials. I think we're almost the same age. Um, Are we geriatric millennials though? I I'm not. Like I don't know. I I, I uh, I'm not. I'm right in the fat part of the bell okay. curve of, right. of uh, so I might be geriatric, but I'm not a geriatric millennial <laughs> okay. according to the definitions. Okay. I got um, I got a lot of uh, Gen Z um, like Twitter followers and people okay. who listen to this podcast, and and I always feel exceedingly old talking to them. Um, but so I might be geriatric, but I'm not technically a geriatric millennial, but I, I feel like our generation is the first generation that for whom the sexual revolution standards, both technological and cultural, um, were the norm, right? Whereas for Gen X, to some extent, and then definitely for baby boomers, um, the sexual revolution was like new and exciting and in, to some extent still transgressive. Um, I think millennials are really the first generation to be raised and come of age, I should say, under the norm that casual sex was acceptable and even encouraged as a norm. Not to say that nobody ever had casual sex before, you know, 1990, obviously, but um, but I, I think we we really were like the the test generation for this. Um, and now that we are in our mid 30s, or or the geriatric millennials are hitting and cresting 40. Um, there's a lot of data that shows that our generation is going to be the uh, the least percentage of us um, are are married, and the smallest percentage um, of women, basically since we started recording these statistics, um, are 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 going to be um, 
or, or are not going to be, I, got, I get, got, got the double negatives confused, but um, basically we have the highest percentage of women who are going to be hitting uh, 40, 45 without having children and without ha being married. Um, and this was supposed to be sexual revolution and sexual pleasure, right? This was supposed to be liberation and fun and everyone was supposed to be, you know, having uh, a, a lot of sex. Uh, and in, what we've ended up with is actually probably less sex, definitely fewer relationships, less lasting relationships, and fewer children. I mean, put all of that together in a stew and um, yeah, never know, mind, never mind been. other <laughs> metrics, like the quality of the sex we're having, right? Like, yeah, it's, I don't, I don't think some of these encounters are really that fun. But I don't know. I'm not right. that experienced personally. But I'm, I'm also, you know, I've got like a lot of millennial women, I think, mixed feelings about birth control and about the, the pill itself. But I think that's all, like you said, it's all in a stew together. Now, I think the truly transgressive position now is to say things like maybe this isn't good. You know, maybe this hasn't worked out well. Um, because I think we're, you know, in general, the at least the sort of left leaning popular culture message is, well, some people haven't gotten married, and some people haven't um, become mothers, but that's great. You know, and then I think a more transgressive or maybe less popular opinion is maybe there was, you know, s some short term decision making that happened for a lot of people in our generation that said, this is liberating. This is fun. I can put this off. I can focus on my career. I can focus on myself now. But then maybe in the long run, I mean, I think people still express desires for for marriage and family. And if those desires aren't being met, then maybe that's maybe that's not good. And I've tried to, you know, in my discussions about this and in my New York Times essay, I've tried to base my arguments in ultimately what is good for people. But people, readers of the New York Times and people on the left keep wanting to come back with how dare you push your morality on me? How dare you push your religious perspective on me? And it's, I'm not even trying to make a religious argument. I'm just trying to say what's really good for people. Has this really been good for people? And that's, I think you get a mixed bag of answers there, but I don't think it's an un, un, unequivocal good. I don't think it's an unadulterated good thing that we've had this increased control over fertility. I think it's changed a lot of other, um, it's had a lot of other effects, some of which are not good. Yeah, I mean, even to talk about this issue in terms of the good in a normative way, I feel like is um, itself a challenge to the way that we think about these issues as a series of unjudgeable choices, right? Uh, the, the worst sin in our culture is judgment. So like there's a series of choices that you make, um, they, they're all fantastic and unjudgeable. Maybe we allow a little bit of therapeutic discussion as to whether or not they were right for you. Um, but we never want to talk about uh, especially sex in any kind of language that, that might be might have words like the good in it. I mean, mm -hmm. do you find that that's what's missing in our discussion? Or do you find that that's such an unbridgeable barrier with people, let's say not the dedicated left, but like, I don't know, your yeah. typical 27 year old woman um, in America that that it's almost a non starter to talk about the good with regard to sex at all? I think I'm encouraged by how I feel like this there's started to be some change on this. I mean, I don't know if it's just me that's sensing that, but um, I've seen more people come out and say, I'm not a conservative, but I'm curious about having better frameworks for sex. Like there's um, a columnist at the Washington Post named Christine Emba, who wrote a book, and I, I think her book is called Rethinking Sex, A Provocation. <laughs> and she's not, you know, I wouldn't say she's, really conservative. Um, but she wrote a book about how surely consent can't be the only thing that we think about, you know, we have to think about putting the good of the other person into our framework for when, when or how to engage in sexual relations with people. And so I was encouraged by that. And then I was further encouraged recently, you know, Louise Perry has a book, um, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. I don't consider her to be like a hardcore conservative or anything. Mary Harrington is like the, um, you know, she's a, a, a feminist who um, she, her Twitter handles move in circles, right? And she's kind of like, she talks about how like progressivism 
and feminism have come into conflict. And I agree with her on these things. So I think there are more people talking about this issue who are not, you know, who don't come from like the Judeo-Christian background of, you know, sex. Um, the, the Christian sexual ethic is, you know, you don't have sex until you're married and then you only ever have sex with your spouse for your whole life. And um, a lot of people have rejected that in our society, but then where did we go from there? You know, we went to a place where, well, you, you, it's like you said, and as you can't judge. So really the only thing that we've attempted to judge in the Me Too movement was kind of evidence of this is like, did you have her consent or did you have his consent? But then I think a lot of people started have started questioning since then, well, is that enough? Is that sufficient? Is that a sufficient framework for how to think about when and how to engage in, in sex? And um, so I'm encouraged by the fact that people are asking these questions and sort of rethinking what the framework should be. Um, because I think it's not it's not served people well to have such a low bar for okay well <laughs> they both said it was okay so I guess that's we're supposed to consider that good sex now <laughs> yeah it's um I I almost have seen the Me Too movement and before that the what I would call the Campus Inquisition um, under Title IX and and with flagrant violations of due process etc. I've almost seen it as a response from the left, an acknowledgement that something about the modern sexual culture isn't working, but then being unable to question exactly what you said, Hadley, of, of re the reinsertion of ethics or, or some kind of framework of good and bad. Um, and, and so therefore, like, I think that's why they, they reached for this concept of consent and made it unworkably broad and impossible. Um, and, and legally, you know, terrifying, I think, to to young men. But um, it's, it's like trying to jam an entire sexual ethic back into this actually pretty limited concept of, of, of consent. Although I will add that not only is it limited in the sense that, you know, <laughs> only a small percentage of bad sex is rape, right? Um, that it, it's, it's also confusing because especially for women, I mean, it, it seems antithetical to the way that women naturally, in my case, like I believe evolutionarily approach sex to ask women in advance to lay out what they will and will not consent to and to have that kind of clear mindedness about it. Um, so much depends on the man and his role in, in all of this and this sort of mating game, right? Um, whether or not he makes himself attractive enough uh, for, for a woman to say yes is like, that's that, that is, I mean, I've just made that the most scientific and, um, you know, unsexy description of what seduction is, right? Yeah. Um, it doesn't leave any room. The, the idea of, of consent being both extremely broad now and extremely um, rigid yeah. leave no room at all for seduction which is why you know have french actresses and stuff coming out against me too because it, it it basically eviscerates french culture yeah well i i think also the way you're talking now you know when you start saying things you start sentences with well especially for women you know now you're talking about sex differences and this is uh, you know kind of opens a can of worms about a whole separate issue in our society but i you know i, I do think it is the um it is of particular interest to feminists and to people who are concerned about women's well-being to be talking about this. And, and I tried to include some statistics in my New York Times. First of all, the, the editing process was was fascinating to me because there are things that they asked me for more, you know, evidence or citations for. And then there were other things that I could just assert. But one of the things that I said, you know, this has been particularly bad for women, they said, well, let's see some evidence of that. And so I revisited some studies about, you know, the mental health consequences of casual sexual encounters. Um, and it turns out it's not great for guys either. Like a lot of guys after the fact um, have feelings of regret or um, depression, you know, after a, a casual sexual encounter. Um, but it is true that, you know, particularly for women, there's been, um, a trade-off and there's been, you know, it seems like we aren't paying enough attention to the ways that women say, this is not fulfilling for me. And this is not, it's not really what I want, you know, um, more in, in the surveys, even, you know, what people want, what women want is a relationship. They want 
they want sex, but they want sex that means something and sex with a partner who is responsive to their individual sexual needs, which are beyond the physical. You know, they, women in general, obviously it's hard to talk about these things without painting in broad strokes, but women's sexual experience is tied up in the attachment that they feel to their partner. And that's an emotional thing. And, you know, I'm, I'm a woman. I have, (laughs) I have sex with my husband. I mean, it is definitely, it's a thing um, from personal experience. I can say how I feel about the sex depends a lot on how I feel about him, you know? And if we can't have frank conversations about that culturally, if we just expect men and women to approach sex the same way, that's, you know, I think not only is that incorrect and, you know, biologically and evolutionarily speaking, not right, but I think it does uh, a disservice to women because I think we've, in the past couple of generations, we've been asking women to approach sex more like men and less like what we're innately or inherently, um, you know, what we tend to do or what we are designed to do, you know, um, what we feel like is in our best interest. Yeah, I mean, you're getting close there to some kind of naturalistic <laughs> argument. And I, uh, I I only note that to say that I think there's this weird, uh, there is, I, I also feel like some kind of breaking in the Overton window around birth control happening. And one of the places that I see it happening is with, or in the naturalistic sort of holistic health movement. Um, and it's always seemed really incredible to me uh, that oftentimes, for example, the same women who will, they're eating all organic, right? They, they want um, all natural products. They won't use like a spray on their countertop if it doesn't have all natural on the label. I'm very, very cautious about what they put in their body. Um, we have had this, and I, I'm definitely part of this. Um, we have had this cultural standard now. And again, I think millennials are really the first generation for whom this became the standard, where It is very common for girls to go on birth control um, at 14 or 15 and not come off it and have those hormones in their bodies for 10, 15, right, 20 years before they they go off that and take it as a daily medication. You know, um, do you think that that's one way to open this conversation, first of all? Because I've seen, so Evie Magazine has published some things about it. I've seen you know, um, reels and TikToks of, of women who are, it's its not ideological at all, the way that they're talking about it. It's about what you put in your body um, saying, okay, well, can we find some alternatives to, you know, that actually honor the way that women are, are naturally and not screw with the hormone balance that women naturally have? Um, you know, one, is that a fruitful way to talk about this? LOL, fruitful. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, two, um, what what are the consequences? I mean, um, medically, I know that you're in favor of putting this over the counter, but and I know that it's a relatively so- safe medication. But I, I find myself in recent years wondering, you know, there are so many stories of women having really bad side effects, myself included. I have my stories of terrible side effects from from birth control. These are like I'm not saying there should never be used by any means, but these are really powerful drugs that we're encouraging girls from their mid teens all the way through into their thirties to take every day. Yeah. So this is all very interesting stuff to me. I mean, you, I I agree that the um, it's interesting to see, especially younger people, I feel like are more likely to be drawn to these arguments about, um, you know, they're, they're less inclined to get on birth control because it's not natural. You know, and they uh, I've seen like the YouTubers who have really focused in on birth control as a health issue. Right. And I'm kind of my arguments have been, well, look at the ways this has changed our norms and changed sexual culture. And that's where my number one concern is. That's not to say that uh, there's no health risk or health concerns. I I don't know as much about it. I do feel like a couple generations of women have been robbed of um, a lot of important self-knowledge <laughs> about our bodies because of the way that birth control kind of mutes some very basic functions. I mean, not just pregnancy, but like ovulation even. And um, so I would like to see more holistic sex education, you know, because when I was in school, it was like, if you mention natural family planning, you get laughed out of the sex ed classroom, you know, but I think that there's actually 
there comes a time in the lives of a lot of women where they've been avoiding pregnancy, avoiding pregnancy, avoiding pregnancy, and then boom, they want to flip the switch and let's get pregnant. And that's when it's really nice to know more about your body and how it works. And, um, you know, I won't get into any details about like cervical mucus or anything like that, but you need to know a lot about your body as a woman um, when it, when you are trying to get pregnant. And it's, you know, also helpful information if you're trying to avoid pregnancy in a natural way, but it's something that f- for too long a time, I think, has been treated as a uh, an unserious part of sex education, because since you have these other, you know, um, chemical birth control options available, you simply don't need to know that about your body. And I think that's sad because we're kind of robbing women of this opportunity to, to know their bodies in a more deep way. Um, so that's, that's one piece of it. I don't know that I can walk down the path, the, the naturalistic path, but so far, because while I do think that there's a good argument to be made for what is natural, I'm also like, you, you know, this and this, I'm married to an MD. Um, I see a lot of like value in medical interventions. I've had, you know, a couple primary postpartum hemorrhages and it's because of modern medicine that they've been able to stop my bleeding. And like, you know, what was natural for generations of women uh, was higher infant mortality, higher maternal mortality, you know, like what is natural, like death is natural. There's a lot, (laughs) there's a lot of bad outcomes that are natural, right? So just because something is natural doesn't mean that it's good. And I thank God that I live in a time where there is modern medicine and where um, we have interventions available to us that can save and prolong life. I don't think that should be our ultimate goal in every case, but I think it is, um, you know, modern medicine provides a lot of good things that we might say are not natural, but are good because they allow us to be healthier and to stay alive for longer. Um, but I do, I do think it's worth thinking about, you know, like I'm speaking to you right now as a pregnant woman. And I, I definitely think more about like what I put into my body and I try not to take, you know, medicines unless I absolutely have to while I'm pregnant, because I'm trying to keep this, this baby that's growing in my uterus safe from like potential um, bad outcomes that can come with, with medicines. Any medicine comes with a risk of side effects, right? So I, to a certain degree, I think the, like I'm drawn to the naturalistic arguments about, well, this isn't natural. Um, You know, we hear the same arguments about, gosh, you know, the gender, um, the gender transitions that kids and some adults are, are taking. These are often, these are hormones that are naturally found within the human body. We're just dosing them, um, you know, in the opposite sex or in a weird, you know, and not weird, but in an unnatural, I should say level. And so I thought about this actually, when I was writing my New York times essay, I was like, we make arguments about, um, gender transitions that we shouldn't, um, put hormones in a person's body, um, because of the potential health effects that could happen. Um, or we at least think that those health effects deserve more scrutiny than they're getting from the medical establishment in this country. And I think that, I think that the same is true of birth control. I think that unfortunately, um, after the COVID pandemic, I have a lot more sympathy for people who do question what the medical establishment line is on everything, because we worry, I think rightfully so, that sometimes because of politics, the guidelines um, that are available um, are not always free of political biases. And that's the nicest way I can put that. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> there's been a deep, like, loss of trust in our medical establishment. And I think that we're going to see birth control, just like vaccination and a handful of other issues, kind of um, get reexamined and people are going to have more questions. And maybe ultimately that's for the best because I think patients do deserve to know more about their own bodies and about their options and about, um, you know, the potential side effects of these drugs, um, that have been used for generations by millions of women, mostly I think, uh, in a safe way, but unfortunately in, I think a way that is just, um, you know, it makes it easy when you put every woman on birth control from a young age, it makes it easy to miss or, um, misdiagnose or, um, not, you know, see other potential health issues that can be going on for, for women. And so I, that's a long answer to a kind of, um, binary question that you asked, but hopefully gives a little more background on my, my position there. Yes. I do think that talking about birth control as a natural or unnatural, uh, technological 
innovation can be helpful to, you know, having a broader discussion about whether or not it's been good or bad for people. Um, but I don't think that whether something's natural is the be all end all question for whether or not it's been good. Yeah, I mean, I think I'm largely in a similar camp. I may be slightly more skeptical generally. Um, but I, I'm, you know, I'm incredibly grateful for antibiotics and, and for anesthesia uh, and, and a variety of other medical advances in the, you know, 19th and 20th century. Germ theory has been a, a great, great advance, yeah. <laughs> advancement for, for, for the human race. Um, but I do find myself like, so uh, maybe it's because my family doesn't come from this country, but so I've, I kind of grew up in a different culture around this at home than what I observed. Um, although not with regard to birth control, interestingly, but just generally about the number of medications that is just common to be on in America, like for relatively young and healthy people has been really shocking to me. And I, I understand a lot of the incentives in the system and why it's so I think um, part part of it is uh, the, the fact that we do have, and this is something I think for us uh, as conservatives and free marketeers who would like to see a more free market in healthcare, right? Um, something for us to, to think about that the consumer relationship to medic to medicine, I think has had some ill effects. Um, like th the fact that, you know, we now think of it as a consumer good means that people walk in and they demand it. I, I, I really think a lot of, I, I have a lot of doctor friends I know your husband's a doctor, like, They've told me, yeah, look, I don't necessarily want to prescribe all this stuff, but my patients walk in and they want a yeah. pill that's going to wake them, walk out and feel better. Yeah. Um, and that's, you know, that's, it's way more complicated than that. And there, as you said, like every intervention has side effects. Now, sometimes those side effects are more than worth risking because the, the problem is so bad or the effects of the drug are so good. But I just, I, I have a, I have a more skeptical orientation than it seems like a lot of people around me do towards putting things. Um, yeah. Well, these things, tend to, these things tend to swing on a pendulum too, in my opinion, like, you know, there was probably a time and maybe still in some cultures, this is true. Uh, if you need medication for depression, anxiety or something like that, it's like, you know, there's probably a time where that was taboo and that was seen as like something you should, be ashamed of or something that's really not done around here. Or that's not good. But now I feel like the pendulum has swung so far on that, that it's like, if there's any hint that someone is experiencing some kind of mental health distress, it's like, well, where's, what's the medicine for that? So and let's make sure that they have access to it because we don't want to be accused of um, restricting access to this or creating a stigma around this. So it's almost like the pendulum swung to the point of encouraging it, you know, and that's not just the case with depression and anxiety drugs. I think that's also can be said of, of birth control. You know, I can't tell you how many people after I wrote this essay sent me messages or tweets, like I was a teen and I was having sex and I, really needed birth control, but there was such a stigma around it. My parents didn't want me to have it. The school nurse wouldn't give it to me. I went to Planned Parenthood. Thank goodness for Planned You know, they, they're so happy that they finally found a place to give them birth control behind their parents' back. But I think that, um, you know, the pendulum swung on that too. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that now if, if you, if there's a whiff of a teenager needs birth control, it's like, boom, give it to them, give it to them in spades, give it to them in all FDA approved forms with no copay and like, where can you, you know, then you get on your Facebook and you brag about how you helped a, a teenager <laughs> get access to birth control because that's the virtue signaling currency of our day. But I think that, um, yeah, it's, I, I think it's just the, the pendulum swang from maybe there's a stigma around this to now I feel like, a, like drugs are encouraged. It's like at the drop of a hat, what do you need a drug for? Let me make sure you have it because I don't want to be the bad guy that stood in the way of you, whether, whether it's through like a regulatory or legal barrier or through like a cultural like stigma or some kind of barrier. Like I don't, nobody wants to be the bad guy that, that says, Hey, do you really need this? No, <laughs> really? Is this really good for you? Is this really what's best for you? Um, because that might be seen as pushing back on what someone sees as their salvation in whatever whatever the drug is. And I mean, obviously, like when it comes to, I think it's obvious, but when it comes to mental health, I think some medications have been life-saving and really helped a lot of people. But um, that doesn't negate what you said, Inez, which is I think that there's like a cultural expectation of I can fix whatever the problem is, whether it's a backache or a toothache 
or a pregnancy or some depression with a drug. And if that's your first line of defense, if that's your, if that's your first plan of action, maybe you're missing out on some other potential solutions to the problem that aren't just taking a drug. Yeah. Um, I, for what it's worth, I mean, um, anecdotally, I had the exact opposite experience. Every medical professional in my life when I was a teen aggressively pushed me on birth control. Um, and not that's because, that's because you were activity. after the swinging of that pendulum. That's because like yeah. you and I came along after this. I, I, I mean, and aggressively behind my parents' back. Um, I mean, that was one time I, I remember my parents got really mad at, at the pediatrician because uh, she was like aggressively pushing birth control. And, and in my case, actually, uh, it's almost embarrassing to admit, but like, you know, I wasn't having sex. I just <laughs> had really bad periods. And, and yeah. that was just the immediate. Yeah. you know, response. And yeah. of course, nobody also in the medic doctor's office even believed me that I wasn't having sex. <laughs> and I didn't need this birth control at 14 or 15. Right. Um, but it was like almost the opposite. It was it was, you know, pull a 14, 13 year old girl aside, tell her like, absolutely, tomorrow, I can get you a prescription yeah. to birth control, your parents don't have to know I can put it on their insurance. I mean, these are California laws that go back. Yeah. And it strikes me that you know, the right. And, um, I think rightly we, we are arguing now against uh, for in favor of parental rights with regard to, um, uh, gender transition, especially for children, right. Um, to, as you say, to pump them full of cross sex hormones, puberty blockers, right. And then worse surgeries. And we're very invested in making sure that parental supervision and control remains there, um, for making those medical decisions. But we already broke that barrier with abortion and birth control. Um, and I know like in California in 2010, there was a proposition that passed that, you know, if a 14 year old girl needs an abortion um, in her, her own 14 year old estimation, um, her parents have no right to know. Well, I, I don't really know the history of those um, changes, but I can imagine that on the birth control issue in particular, that a lot of conservatives would have gone along with that because and I cite this polling in my essay because a lot of pro-life conservatives see birth control as a tool to reduce abortion, you know? And so if you're like, if you're a staunchly pro-life conservative and you have no moral or religious qualms about birth control, then it kind of, you know, the logic checks out. If you can make birth control more widely available, even to teenagers, then you potentially reduce unplanned pregnancy, which reduces the number of people who would seek abortions. And so I can understand why, you know, I, I agree with you. It's a good point that, you know, parent, I, I, and I, my, my kids are so young, they're not talking about these things yet. My daughter's still like fascinated by how this baby made its way into my, into mommy's <laughs> tummy. Like, how did that happen? Um, but I can imagine a time would come where I would absolutely want to be in the know about, you know, not just their decisions about birth control and, and abortion, but about their sexual activity in the first place, you know? And so that's all that stuff is, is tied up together. But I could see how from a public policy perspective, you could talk a lot of otherwise conservative people into removing parental consent or notification around birth control if they thought that by doing so they could reduce abortion. Um. How, how true is it that the link runs that way? Because uh, in your piece, you cite some some polling to some extent or some some evidence to the contrary. And it, this is one of the least intuitive pieces of data that I, I've actually encountered, but it appears to be true. I, I've yeah. looked up, there's a bunch of surveys, even from the Guttmacher Institute, which is Planned Parenthood's <laughs> research arm, right? Yeah. That, uh, you know, that un unwanted pregnancy and birth control and the widespread avail availability of birth control actually run together and not in opposition. Why do you think that is? Well, it goes back to what I said earlier about the promise of the pill is different from what it's delivered. You know, the promise of the pill is you can have sex without the risk of pregnancy. But the risk of pregnancy persists because of the failure rate of the pill, which is has been the most widely used form of contraception for a long time. I think that's changing because I think we're seeing more people using what's called 
long acting reversible contraception like IUDs and you can get a shot, you can get an implant. There's a variety of new technologies um, that are more effective than the pill. But for a long time, the pill has reigned. And, um, you know, I also wonder, this is self-reported data, so I don't know, you know, if you come in with an unexpected pregnancy, the doctor may ask, well, were you using birth control? And that's, that's just a self-reported answer. <laughs> so I don't know if I believe that, but um, certainly, you know, there's, there's a lot of factors at play here. And, and a lot of the factors do surprise or did surprise some of my reading audience. You know, there's a much higher rate of people seeking abortions who are not married. Um, and that's, that's not necessarily because people who are not married experience a higher rate of unexpected pregnancy. I mean, people who are married have sex more frequently and every sexual encounter, you know, has some risk of, of pregnancy. It's just that when people are married and they have an unplanned pregnancy, they're less likely to seek an abortion because they're more likely to say, well, we're in this stable relationship. Presumably we have a home together. We have, you know, possibly other children together. So, um, we'll just figure it out. We'll figure out how to keep the baby. Whereas, you know, that's, that's, that's the only difference between, I think, the, the pregnancy within a marriage and pregnancy outside of a marriage is that you're in a better position to, to keep the baby. And so there's a lot of people walking this earth whose parents never really intended for them to be born. But if it happened within a marriage, then the, it's, you know, it seems like the, the cost or the consequence was lower than for two people who otherwise weren't planning on having a lifelong co-parenting relationship, but now have to contemplate that among the other costs and consequences of having a child. So, um, so all of this is to say that, yes, the availability of the pill changed sexual norms and the uh, increased sexual activity outside of marriage created more unintended pregnancies that, you know, I, I hate to use this term, but really unwanted pregnancies, you know, not just unintended, but not desired, you know, and so that, that relates to the demand for abortion. And um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's not that illogical how those things are, are related. Um, but the missing piece for a lot of people is understanding that contraceptives are only so effective, and they haven't totally removed the risk of pregnancy. Um, now, the answer to that from a lot of people, particularly people who disagree with me about you know, the sexual revolution <laughs> are, are, well, let's get better technologies out there. Let's an IUD in every uterus, a chicken in every pot. You know, it's like, that's their solution is like, let's just, let's just make it easier for people to get IEDs. And, um, I am not surprised at that, you know, response or the push for that, because I do think they're highly effective. And that's a big part of, you know, we've seen demand for abortion decrease. It's in part due to people, having less sex. Um, but it's also in large part due to these more effective forms of contraception being more, um, more used. Yeah. Let's, let's, um, touch on before we, we wrap up, let's touch on the having less sex aspect. Cause you, <laughs> you, you throw this into your piece, right. Yeah. Um, and it's one of those things again, kind of like we, we opened this discussion by talking about me too, as, as sort of this very, um, in my view, and I think yours, like this very negative way of responding to the realities, the unpleasant realities about the sexual revolution, where like, I might agree with somebody on the left who describes the, the modern sexual culture as, as, um, you know, as, as heartbreaking and, and difficult and, um, in my view, like terrible, right. Uh, but then those, those feelings associated with the consequences of the sexual revolution just got channeled into this box called consent and ended up in my view making some very bad law um and very bad situations um it, it almost seems like one of those situations where you have folks um i think even i was reading some of the the comments on your new york times article by the way oh, the comments on the new york times articles are the most terrifying thing in the universe to me because it's not because they're like, um, cause you get, you know, anywhere on the internet, you, you get the like caps lock, angry, like 
exclamation Troll. point, exclamation yeah. point, trolling comments. Yes. In the New York Times comment section terrifies me more than anything else because they're always like well punctuated. The, the, the points are made well. Um, I mean, I don't mean logically. I mean, there's just, you know, normal sentences formulated. Grammar's then you good. have yeah. <laughs> then you have people being like, Mao was a great person. Yeah. His his the Maoist revolution was really fantastic. And let me give you three reasons why. You know what I mean? Like you have this completely outlandish opinions, but but delivered in such a normal way that it freaks me out. Anyways, um, so I was reading the New York Times comment section under your piece, and, yeah. and there were some objections basically saying, because you threw in some stuff saying. Um, at the end, you know, yes, we've seen a decrease in teenage pregnancy, uh, but that's maybe more associated with teens not being interested in sex because they're too online or they're not having in-person interactions. And some of those comments were like, well, how do we please the conservatives, right? Yeah. The teens are, we're getting pregnant and it was a problem, um, unwed pregnancy, but now they're not getting pregnant and it's a problem. You know, so so uh, why did you include that? And, and what do you think uh, about the, the sort of future of where, because we've talked about millennials being the first generation, but it seems to me that the generation after us, Gen Z, um, is, is uh, grappling not just with the technology of the pill as the baseline and fertility control as the baseline, but now uh, a digital existence as the baseline. Yeah. And yeah, it turns out that the digital existence contains uh, it really... It, it has zero risk of pregnancy. That's one of the things <laughs> in the world that has zero risk of pregnancy. You're not going to have an AI baby. Yeah. I, um, whew, there's a lot there. I think that, you know, there were some important, uh, assumptions missing. There's just this chasm between the left and the right on certain things. You know, I, I wrote this essay and then it was a surprise to me to find out some people described it as a pro birth control thing. And some people described it as an anti birth control thing. And I'm like, great. So <laughs> if you read it, I think I, I come off as kind of mixed overall on birth control. And that would be, I would say congruent with my personal experience. Like I'm not that big on birth control personally, not a big user of it. I'm pregnant with my fourth baby. So I've got, you know, some evidence that I'm not really that <laughs> like enthusiastic of a user of birth control. But I, um, I also, you know, I think on the left, there's this tendency of, well, if someone says that something's bad, someone says they don't agree with something or they think this might even just be like a, they're skeptical about it, they're out to ban it and take it away from you. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> I can be, you know, I can say that I don't particularly think that watching, you know, R-rated movies is good for people, but I'm not going to take that away from people. You know, like there's, you, you pick your poison, you know, like in this world, I think there's a lot of things that we could all do better for our minds, our bodies and our souls, but I'm not out to regulate every single one of those things. And that's, I think that was a piece that was missing. And when it came to the, the teen sex piece, the reason I included that is because I'm not just interested in what's good for societies or people's bodies or even what's best for families. Although I think those are all important concerns. I'm interested in what's good for people's souls you know, and I didn't use the term souls in my piece because that would, that would out me as a religious person, I guess. But I'm interested in what's good for people beyond just avoiding the risk of pregnancy because birth control can at least reduce that risk. And if we all have IUDs, then maybe we'll totally mute that, you know, we'll just, humankind will just go extinct. Um, but I, I do think, you know, the reduction in teen sexual activity has been a fascinating thing to watch. Because there was a time when, and I remember, you know, living through this, teen pregnancy was a really big problem when I was a teenager. And um, when if you said, well, maybe we should encourage abstinence more, or maybe we should, you know, talk about the risks of, of sex, not just talk about safe sex, but try to kind of discourage people from having sex with people that they don't want to procreate with. Again, you were kind of laughed out of the room for saying stuff like that because the idea was we will never, the toothpaste is out of the tube, we will never get teens to have less sex. Teens are having sex and they're going to be having sex and they're going to be having sex as much as they're having sex right now forever into infinity. And that was the assumption. And um, that wasn't actually the reality, though. That wasn't the case. That's not what history has revealed. History has revealed that teens are having less sex. But it's not... <laughs> 
it's not for the best of reasons. And it's not because they have their souls have turned towards something good. Um, instead, I think, you know, the souls of teenagers have turned to this, to this device, you know, to, to watch TikTok videos all the time, or maybe even watching porn and masturbating. And, you know, it's not, it's a different kind of sexual activity, but it's not one that'll get you pregnant. Um, so I, I mentioned that in, you know, in one sense, just to, uh, kind of as a middle finger to people who said, you know, you'll never get people to have less sex because it turns out they have started having less sex. But also I had to include the caveat that it's not for the reasons that conservatives wanted. It wasn't because people said, ah, oh, I'm going to take better care of my soul. <laughs> you know, they, instead they just found other temptations and found other, other things, you know, to, to dedicate their, their souls to. <laughs> um, and it's not necessarily been good. You know, if you look at the mental health of adolescents and young adults in this country, it's not good. So, um, and, and I think it's also not been good for their bodies and for families and for society and for those other things. But I mentioned that also because my, one of my suggestions in terms of, you know, if birth control can be a tool to reduce demand for abortion, so can more sexual restraint. And when I say sexual restraint, I don't just mean less sex. I mean, less sex of a particular kind. I mean, less sex that leads to a woman in a desperate situation. And that's, that's, unfortunately, that's where a lot of casual encounters have put a lot of women. And I'm interested in, in that because ultimately I'm interested in people's souls and, and what's best for their souls, not just what's best for their bodies or their pocketbooks, but really what's, what makes them feel like, you know, and what, what really truly signals that they are having a good life. I want people to have a good life, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's really, you know, we could talk for another hour about this, but I, I really have moved a lot in my short time as like a public policy and political commentator, I guess, from, um, I used to go on John Stossel's show and I really believed in like live and let live. And, um, to a certain degree, I still believe in that, but there's a part of me that is becoming less bashful about saying what I really think is good for people because I do, I, I don't just want to let people live their lives in a way that's, that's going to destroy their souls. And I don't want to use the power of government to stop them, but I at least want to give them information that's truthful and helpful towards making better decisions. And so that was, that's kind of why I write the, that's kind of why I do what I do <laughs> in general every day. But that was also part of my motivation behind this essay was if I can get anybody, you know, particularly elites in our society who are driving narratives about sex and about our dating culture, if I can get them to acknowledge that, you know, maybe what we've been telling young people, young men and young women for the past couple generations about sex hasn't been working out so well, and we need to take a step back and re-examine this, then it's worth writing and it's worth, you know, facing the goblins in the, in the comment section. <laughs> on, on, on that thoroughly non-materialistic note, um, Hadley Manning, thank you so much for coming on High Noon. You can read her essay, The Conservative Position on Birth Control is about individual responsibility at the New York Times, one of the few times I'm going to direct you to go read the New York Times. Hadley, thanks so much for coming on High Noon. Thanks, Inez. And thank you to our listeners. High Noon with Inez Stepman is a production of the Independent Women's Forum. As always, you can send comments and questions to inez.stepman at iwf.org. Please help us out by hitting the subscribe button and leaving us a comment or review on Apple Podcasts, Acast, Google Play, YouTube, or iwf.org. Be brave, and we'll see you next time on High Noon.